This is Ham Radio Now, episode 134, ARDF, Amateur Radio Direction Finding. I'm Gary Pierce, scan 4 iq And actually, what I'm doing here is pulling out from the vault, from our parent company, ARVN, Amateur Radio Video News, the very first DVD that I produced. This was back in 2006, so eight years ago, almost 10 years ago, almost a decade Back, back in time. Let me show you the close-up of this here. The 2006 ARDF for USA ARDF Championships International Style Amateur Radio Direction Finding. So you might know this as uh, fox hunting. The reason I'm pulling this out is, frankly, because I got a little intimidated by these guys, the TX Factor, the uh, program that uh, Jeff and I reviewed in uh, the previous episode 133 of Ham Radio Now. Their program was very good, and it was all field production. They got they towed their cameras out there into the world and did a magazine-type show with uh, three programs in it, all um, highly edited field production and all very well done. And I felt that I needed to show that I have done that sort of thing. It's not so much what Ham Radio Now is all about these days. And I'm getting a little bit of heat online for that. Some folks are saying, time to get you know, get your cameras back out into, into the field. Well, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do that, at least not anytime soon. It's the economy thing. But at least I could dig some things out that I have done before and not yet put online and, uh, and let you see them. When I did this program, I, uh, I was ambitious. I had about 300 copies made. This is what's left. Actually, about 100 of them turned out to be bad because I was just learning at the time, just learning how to uh, compress and, and make DVDs. And, and my settings weren't all perfect. So, so I made, but I made uh, about 300 copies. They, they cost about two bucks a piece to have pressed. I got some halfway decent publicity in uh, this issue of QST. The... Um, the May 2008 issue, I got, um, it wasn't a review, it was just a uh, new products announcement, but it was nice. So it, it got some, some attention, and I think I might have done some advertising on the AWRL website even, uh, even back then. Um, and it sold a grand total of 121 copies so far. I think it, it even sold one copy earlier this year, so <laughs> it was a little disappointing. Um, I was selling them for 20 bucks a piece. So I thought, well, let me get them online and, uh, and let you see the program now. So several thousand people can see it. And you can see that, yes, I'm able to do field production pretty much on par on quality with, uh, with the TX Factor guys. So if you like this program now, and don't worry about the 2006 part. It's got nothing to do with the results of that year. And they, they do this every couple of years. Uh, nothing to do with the results of this year. Everything to do with the techniques and the equipment and the people. And as Jeff says, ham's doing ham stuff. So go ahead and enjoy it. If you like the program, remember Arvin back there. He's still in charge of our finances. Stop by hamradionow.tv. And this would have cost you 20 bucks to buy. <laughs> uh, the, the idea at that time was not to sell one of these to every ham. It was to sell them to radio clubs. And I was hoping for four or 500 radio clubs and play them as a club meeting program. I kept it down to about 35 minutes. Um, that didn't work out so well. You know, it, some clubs bought the DVDs and played them, and I got rave reviews. It, it just didn't get out there as well as it needed to, and so I'm trying. This is, this is actually plan C. Plan A was to do something like TX Factor. A, uh, a magazine-style show on DVD because the, the web was not capable of doing this kind of production at that time, back in 2004, 2006. But it would have been, would have been a magazine show, maybe three programs on a, a DVD, each about 10, 12 minutes long. Um, that didn't work out. Uh, I couldn't keep things that short. So this program became a, an individual, more of a documentary type, sitting at about 35 minutes all by itself. So that was plan B, and when plan B didn't work out very well, well, here we are at probably what you'd call plan C, which is online as ham radio now. All right, let's get to, um, actually, it's just up the road. 
uh, from me in, in a park in uh, near Raleigh, North Carolina, where they were holding the 2006 USA ARDF Championship and roll the DVD. What are these people doing? Well, believe it or not, this is ham radio. Hi, I'm Gary Pierce, KN4AQ, and on this edition of ARVN, Amateur Radio Video News, we're gonna take a look at a very special kind of fox hunting called ARDF, Amateur Radio Direction Finding. The 2006 ARDF US Championship took place right here in Umstead Park in Raleigh, North Carolina back in April 2006. Let me set the stage a little bit. When I was a young ham back in the 60s, I had a lot of fun with fox hunting. Now, depending on what part of the country or what part of the world you're from, you may have called them tea hunts or bunny hunts or just hidden transmitter hunts. Back in the old days, they took place on six meter AM. We'd just stick a mast through the open window of the car, put a beam on top, and off we'd go. In the 70s, most fox hunts moved to two meter FM, and the handheld radios let us get out of the cars a little bit. But even today, fox hunts like that are still, for the most part, automotive events. In Europe, though, hams and a lot of non-hams have been fox hunting on foot for decades. That's the sport they call ARDF. And it's a combination of direction finding and another sport called orienteering. Though I suppose I need to explain the sport of orienteering. You get a compass and a map, a very detailed map of something like this park that shows landmarks and terrain elevation and stuff. Somebody goes out and hides a few orange and white flags are actually called controls, out in the woods, and they mark the locations on your map, and off you go. Since the person who finds them all the fastest is the winner, you do a lot of running. Okay, if all that sounds a little bit too easy, and it's harder than it looks, especially the running part for some of us, ham radio makes it a little bit more difficult. With radio orienteering, the control flags are not marked on the map. You put a transmitter at each flag, and you have a receiver and a directional antenna, and off you go. Well, maybe there's a little more to it than that. So let's roll back to April 2006, when a couple of dozen hams from around the country and around the world gather right here for this most unusual event. It is Friday, April 8th, and event coordinator Charles Charlo, NZ0I, is heading off into the woods. Heading into the woods to place some uh, transmitters for practice. Got 27 people here uh, from all over the country looking to find some 2 meter transmitters tomorrow and some 80 meter transmitters on Sunday. So we're going to put a couple of each out today and let them get some practice with the actual transmitter transmitters they'll be hunting the next two days. I began to get a clue just how serious this event was going to be when I saw how far Charles and his helper, Steve Worley, KB4HDQ, headed into the woods for these practice transmitters. Yeah, let's put the two meter one here. This is one of our two meter egg beater antennas. But most people may never actually see the antenna or the transmitter, but what they're after is the flag, and in particular this punch that they'll use to put a pattern of holes in their scorecard to prove that they actually found the flag, if not the transmitter. Yeah. Haven't seen our German competitors yet. And with the two meter transmitter in place, Charles and Steve head off to plant the 80 meter transmitter and antenna. It's just a, about a 50 foot length of wire and we need to get it at least 50 feet into a tree so we can have it fully extended vertically. The transmitters only put out a couple of watts into a rather inefficient antenna. But it's okay because they only need to be heard from a couple miles away. According to the rules, the flag is supposed to be within about five meters of the transmitter. 
five yards. These transmitters are just for practice. Charles said that the real transmitters will not be placed this close or this visible to the trail. So with the practice transmitters on the air, let's take the long walk back to the staging area and meet some of the contestants as they check out their equipment. This is um, a stopwatch, which you can start when you start to run and you can see how long we have been underway. And... You gotta really fight to get the, the sense of tenor to work. But uh, receiver-wise, they're the hottest receiver I've seen. I think they rival the Ukrainian units. They're a very, very good receiver. I haven't had much problem with the sense antenna. Once I get an idea of a general direction, yeah, I'm good. I fought with it a bit. How was your trip in? Oh, great. Yeah, it was about a 10 hour drive. All we need is signal now. We do need a signal. You might have noticed already that most of the contestants have earphones on their receivers. And so as we watch them hunt the transmitters, most of what we hear is their feet crunching through the leaves. So to give you an idea of what they're hearing, I slipped a wireless mic into the earphone of Jay Hennigan, WB6RDV from Santa Barbara, California. And for the moment at least, we hear what he hears. And this is what it sounds like, DFing an 80 meter beacon. The null is really sharp. It's the null. Now I'll try the sense antenna. That's the peak with the sense antenna. And that's the null. So what direction is it telling you it's go the signal's coming from? Well, with the null it can either be in front of me or behind me, because it's bi-directional. When I flip it sideways where this tape is and press the sense button, it changes the pattern so it's one directional. Transmitter's right here. It's a few feet away. Yeah. And you're still making a null. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still getting a null. It's amazing. This is a Ukrainian unit. You can see by some of the writing. It's hand calibrated, handmade. This is the attenuation control that uh, lets you adjust like RF gain. Uh, this is a bandwidth, lets you choose wide or narrow bandwidth. Uh, this is the switch that uh, activates this antenna, changes the antenna pattern. I've been told you can get these for about $200. This is a homebrew version in the hands of Mike Sigelski, K8EHP, from Cleveland, Ohio. Mike's come out to hunt along with his wife, Mary, KC8YLC. He's also allowed me to slip my microphone inside his earphones so we can hear what he's receiving. Now, I'm no expert, but as we listen, I don't think Mike's receiver is working quite right. There's Fox number two. Can you pick that up? So are you guys competitors or team or what? Well, we're competitors, but uh, I'm new at this, so I'm learning a lot from my husband. So I'm having fun out here doing this. Have you got the hang of it yet? Uh, well, we'll see tomorrow, huh? <laughs> this is a relatively new sport here. It started in Europe and uh, was brought over here, and it's really taking on over here in the United States. It, it can be rather challenging. Last year's uh, took, uh, took place in the deserts in New Mexico at 8,000 feet. And that uh, tended to take your breath away beside the physical effort of going up and down. You can't run the entire course. You have three hours to finish this. It's impossible to run the whole thing, at least for, for me and in my age category. There's, there's five or six different age categories, depending on male or female. And uh, the younger sprouts uh, can, can run this thing. And uh, people my age category do, do some trotting, not just running. <laughs> if it were me, and one day I think it might be, there'd be a lot of walking and very little running. Meanwhile, 
Mike and Mary headed out to find the practice transmitters, and I tagged along with my wireless mic tucked in Mike's earphone. I think we're more over that way. How do you tell one transmitter from another? The number of beeps. Each transmitter sends MO in Morse code, and then at the end of MO it sends uh, one beep, two beeps, three beeps, four beeps, or five beeps. So that tells you if it's one, two, three, four, or five. Each of the five transmitters stays on the air for one minute. So in five minutes, you get a complete cycle. Right straight ahead of us, and it's stronger than it's been before. So we're doing the right thing. We may have been doing the right thing. You couldn't tell by me, I was lost even though I'd been to the transmitter when Charles hid it. Unfortunately, Mike and I never found it. But Mary. So, uh, this is looking like that wife swap video show. <laughs> no, no, no. You just, just hook, up with, hook up with a better partner or what? <laughs> yeah. It's just an 80 meter lesson. We're, we're, yeah, and, and, uh, from somebody who really knows. <laughs> I think I'll be able to help me with this. We've got a, a couple of really good pointers already. What did he tell you? Well, first to line up for the null. So you find a direction right through here is the null. And then once you identify the null, then go 80, uh, 90 degrees this way and 180 that way to find out which direction to go into. And that's the where I point yeah. to the sense. Find the null, lay it down, and draw a line in the direction of the null. So if your map is aligned to north, like just like the ground is obviously aligned to north, you're, you know where you are, you draw a line in the direction, you've drawn a bearing pointing toward the transmitter. Got that, Mike? Well, the really bad news is not that Mike and I never found the 80 meter practice transmitter. And Mary did. It's that Mike twisted his knee while climbing over a log, and that took him out of the competition for the rest of the weekend. I'm sorry, Mike, but thank you for showing me the ropes, and I hope you have many more successful hunts down the road. I know we're close, because even when I get my peak the, and the null, the null is quite strong also, so we're getting a very strong signal into the, into the machine. We're getting a lot of RF in. Now, let's head back to the shelter and wrap up our practice day, and look forward to the competition tomorrow. The weather tomorrow is not looking terribly good. Uh, depending on who you want to believe, it's either going to be very rainy early and then tapering off in the afternoon, or it's going to be relatively drier early and then severe thunderstorms in the afternoon. So based on the conflicting information, we're going to go with our original schedule of uh, starting at 10 o'clock and hope for the best. All right, well, ha have a pleasant evening and good luck to everybody. And don't forget your SI. We can get up sometimes. So uh, the the cleats. Oh my gosh! He's off here already. Yeah, <laughs> here already. <laughs> yeah. So the, the orienteering cleats really help. Yeah, uh, get, cool. They give you good traction that. with a, with a, This is Bob Fry, WA6EZV. Bob's a California transplant to Cincinnati, Ohio. He's also an ARDF pro. He's at his 11th championship, and he's been to the world championship three times. We're going to learn a lot from Bob. And uh, we took the challenge up, and we thought, you know, we have to learn a little orienteering, and we have to get in shape. So two of us, I, uh, Dick Arnett, WB4SUV, and myself, decided, okay, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it. Between uh, the time we were invited in April and the time we went in September, I think combined we lost about uh, 60 pounds. <laughs> Okay, name, call sign, and where you're from? Um, I don't have a call sign, but my name is Chauti Stortoy. I'm from New York City. Okay, how do you spell your name? C-S-A-B-A, -A, the first name. The last name is T-I-S-Z-T-T-E-R-T-O. Okay, common spelling. Yeah, exactly. It's very <laughs> easy for you. And how'd you get interested in, in this kind of activity if you're not a ham? Um, I have a friend of mine next to me, Lloyd Jury. He is four, five, six times world championship, right? Five. Five times, and he introduced me to sports. We did orienteering the same club in Hungary, like 20-something years ago. I competed the first time with the U.S. team uh, in 98 uh, in Hungary. 
and it, it was the first uh, international event for for the USA. And since that uh, World Championship, everything everything is changed in the US. Uh, the transmitters, the receivers, the mentality, everything is changed. The shape of the competitors, everything. It's very interesting and very impressive. I'm April Mel. I'm WA6OPS. I'm from Fullerton, California, and I'm the field medic. I've done a lot of um, wound care primarily in these events where people have gotten scratched, they've had brief falls, and they end up with scratches on their arms or their legs. People have gotten into nettles, things like that, that we, uh, we take care of for them. The actual starting line is at a secret location a couple of miles from the shelter, so everyone gets bussed over there with their gear. One thing I noticed is that ARDF is quite a family event. We've got husbands and wives like Mike and Mary, and this is Harley and Carla Leach, KI7XF and KC7BLA from Bozeman, Montana. And here's a father-daughter combo, Brian DeYoung, K4BRI, and Emily, K4MLE. They're from Alexandria, Kentucky. We have lots of cameras, so this may take a while. Once everyone arrives, Joe Mel, K0OV, takes the customary group photo. Joe is Mr. Fox Hunt. He has literally written the book on fox hunting, along with a continuing series of magazine articles. And he's the ARRL's ARDF coordinator. He had a lot to do with getting ARDF started in the U.S. Well, I uh, did a lot to try to get it started. Uh, beginning in about 1985, we had our first event in Southern California, and uh, we've kind of taken off ever since. We've been to the World Championships ever since 1998, so uh, we're actually not newcomers to the World Championships. Meanwhile, our contestants have been dropping their equipment off at the impound area. The contestants will start two at a time, five minutes apart. So the receivers are impounded so those waiting don't get the unfair advantage of extra time getting initial bearings. This is the starting gate and the start corridor. Each time transmitter number one cycles on, a pair of contestants has to run to the end of the corridor, out of sight of the next group waiting at the starting line, before they can stop to take their bearings. Okay, what do they do then? The first thing I tend to do is get bearings on each of the transmitters to try and figure out which ones are close, which ones are far away, approximately where I think they might be on the map. Um, and then based on that, I'll decide to what route I think I can get the most, most transmitters in before I have to get back to the finish line. The first five minutes is the most critical five minutes of, of the competition, I think, because it pretty much determines what order you're going to you're going to hunt them in. On this band, which is a two meter band, it's better to keep moving when you take your bearings because they'll, they'll average out reflections. If you stop and stand still, you might be getting a bearing on a reflection. If you're moving, those will tend to average out. Usually, you'll have your map about five minutes before you start. So one of my strategy is to look at the map and try to guess where the course setter is going to have the transmitters and make an initial strategy of which direction to head um, initially even before you turn your radio on. Our first two contestants are our youngsters, Jay Thompson, W6JAY, and Emily DeYoung, K4MLE. I love those call signs. Jay is the 2003 ARRL Hiram Percy Maxim Award winner, and he's also the Newsline Young Ham of the Year. They've both been in ARDF for several years, and Emily says, it's not that hard. It's not as hard as it looks, you know? You think of it looking at a map and, you know, oh, I don't want to do this. It's, it's not really that hard to do, and it's, it doesn't take a lot of thinking, really. So you can, it's, it's a good sport to do if you don't have anything else to do. That's the sound of transmitter number five. When its minute is up, the start of transmitter number one will cue Brian and Harley to clock through the gate and run down the corridor, taking their first bearings and starting to decide which transmitter to head to first. And so it goes until all the contestants are on the course. Here's what it looks like at the end of the corridor. 
It takes almost a minute to reach the end. This is Bill Smathers, KG6HXX. And by the time he can stop, or in his case, just slow down, transmitter number two is just coming on the air. So what do you do? Wait around to get bearings on all five, or just make a good guess and keep moving? The next two contestants won't leave the starting line until the end of the cycle, so you've pretty much got the place to yourself. But everyone I watched kept on moving. And check out Bill's antenna waving technique. And compare it to the sedate style of Brigitte Ruth, a competitor from Germany who's just getting started in ARDF. I'm a beginner and I need a lot of more experience. So two meter, I'm really having problems. In case you couldn't hear Brigitte over that hollering, she said she's having problems on two meters. That's because the bearings you get on two meters aren't nearly as precise as the sharp null that you saw earlier on 80 meters. And also because the two meter signals have a lot of reflections. So as you swing your beam, you usually get several peaks, and the strongest one isn't always the right one. Charles, NZ0I, gives us a demonstration. Okay, so what we're hearing is a high pitch means the signal's strong, the low pitch is the signal's weak, but we'll hear several high pitches as you spin around. So go ahead and show that. Clearly, this is where the signal is strongest. We're, we're almost getting a null in the direction of the transmitter. Okay. But so the reflection is very strong now. So you're really cheating because you know which way the transmitter <laughs> That's is. That's right. If you didn't know, you'd, you'd be thinking it's off that way, and in reality, it's kind of off that way. Yes, but what would help me would be that I've already run several kilometers from the start. And during that time, I would have taken uh, bearings to the transmitter from 10 or 15 different locations. And what you have to do then is look at your map, look at your bearings and kind of average them uh, and see, especially those bearings that you took from high elevations, which ones you want to believe. Okay, it's time for us to get on the trails. And by us, I mean Steve Worley, KB4HDQ, and to a lesser extent, me. Steve volunteered to carry a small video camera and try to follow Jackrabbit J throughout the course. Now here's where some orienteering skills come into play. You know, or you think you know, which direction the next transmitter is. But do you head straight for it? Bob Fry explains that the shortest distance between two points may not be a straight line. Route choice is a big part of the game. Uh, sometimes straight line is not the best way to do it. <laughs> Okay, it can really slow you down. Do you see a lot of people doing that though? Oh yeah, there are a lot of guys that just barrel straight on through. And uh, I've seen it uh, benefit them and I've seen it hurt them both ways. I'd much rather take the road in a, a couple hundred meter detour than go down a, a big valley and up a big alley. You spend an awful lot of energy going down and up and it slows you down. All right, here's the deal. Charles blindfolded me and dropped me off by helicopter in the middle of the woods, or at least along this road, but told me I would probably find transmitter number five up that hill. So let's go trudge and see if we can find it before any competitors get by. Did you see anybody waving funny antennas back there? Yeah. Many. We thought they were trying to get a special TV program. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Made our hair stand up. <laughs> Who were they? They weren't carrying antennas, but they were wearing numbers. They are crazy people. They're part of a 100 mile run. That's almost as much as four marathons in one day, taking place in Umstead Park the same day. And I don't think our receivers made their hair stand on end. Okay, on to transmitter number five, which probably also does not make hair stand on end although it did make for some weary fox hunters. It was a long way from the starting line. Let's watch a few of them find the prize.
the light rain began on my walk to back line. to the uh, finish line. Huh? Headed to the finish line? Yeah, I hope so. I hope I can find it. <laughs> hard. Very hard. Long. Transmitters are way out. Way out. Is that good or bad? If you're running, it's bad. This, light, this hill is killing me. Number five was so far out, I don't believe it. I can't believe. I'm just gonna make it in. Did you find uh, all the all yeah, four? I got them. I got them all. I just gotta get to this trail. Get in. Everybody's looking for a trail on the map. And uh, and I think I found it. And I think it's closed. And I'm guessing this is why. It looks like they haven't cleared uh, fallen trees from uh, Hurricane Fran a long time ago. That looks like people have still been walking this route. Let's see if it gets me to the finish line. And there is what everybody's looking for, the finish line. I don't think I'm coming in the official path. W4OSS, 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 Okay. There you go and put, oh, put your uh there, there you go. Uh, <laughs> oh man, just for me. I got I got three out of the four I was looking for. Um got close to here and decided oh I might go for the fourth one and then decided not to. <laughs> that was number five? Yeah, it was MO5, which was a good idea because that would have been quite a ways away. And the course was uh, rather lengthy too. A um, lot of long distances between each transmitter, but all in all, it was a pretty good course, challenging. This is great. Uh, I'm just so pleased that the weather, you know, this isn't actually bad running weather, a little run in the rain, this is fun. And I think everybody had a good time too. But that didn't mean they didn't complain a little. <laughs> it was frustrating. I couldn't even get a good fix on the homing beat. I mean, it was just everywhere. Yeah. Well, the initial <laughs> fixes from out of the chute, just everything just said, everything's east, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The end of a long, hard, rewarding day. A cold front passed overnight, and the sky was blue, the sun was out, and it was chilly as everyone got ready for the 80 meter hunt. Charles and Nadia are both putting the transmitters out a tad late. I think we're going to be okay. Uh, we'll still be able to start at nine. So you, you hunt on the knoll and not the peak? Is that the way you. Yeah, I hunt on the knoll. Uh huh. Yeah, well, no, and this is very deep. Uh -huh. yeah. mm. I came in and I crossed, I couldn't find this trail. Mm -hmm. So I was up here and I crossed country trying to find it. Mm -hmm. And I hit the one that comes down just below it. Mm -hmm. And I started to cross the bridge. I says, wait a minute, that's wrong. <laughs> yeah. This is a Russian compass. It's a very highly magnet, magnetic needle. And I don't know if you can see the little uh, disc that's in there and the fluid that's inside. But if you watch the needle when we make rapid transitions, it's like it doesn't move at all. You can use this compass while running. Unlike the compasses that we're used to in the U.S. that kind of jiggle and move and overshoot. This is the 80 meter start area. This course is at a completely different part of the park. So anything the contestants learned about the roads and trails yesterday is useless today. There's the usual impound area. There's quite a variety of equipment available to buy or build thanks to the sport's popularity in Europe. I can't tell you much about them, but you can look up ARDF on the web. A good place to start is Joe Mel's webpage, homingin.com. Dick Arnett, WB4SUV, and Jerry Boyd, WB8WFK, are starting first today. And that's Steve Worley running after them with camera number two. 
You can see the difference in technique between 2 meters and 80 meters. Both Dick and Jerry stop at the end of the corridor and take bearings while standing still. And then they're off. Meanwhile, back at the starting line... Is that a victory dance? No, it's a freezing dance. <laughs> I'm sure Vadim will warm up once he gets running. Well, he must have. He won his category. And he won in his two-meter category yesterday. Has anyone mentioned yet it's cold? Today, Charles has provided me with a map that tells me where one of the transmitters is, transmitter number two, and I am trying to find it using pure orienteering. And as it turns out, my orienteering skills are pretty good, because there it is. Now we wait for someone to find it by radio. Bob Titterington, G3ORY, was the first to arrive, but for an unfortunate reason. Which ones have you been to? None. It's my first. Because I'm hobbling, I've had to abandon four and five. I've got to pull my calf muscles on the training day. So I thought I'd get this one and enjoy myself in the forest. Buddies Bob Fry and Dick Arnett were next. And it turns out that my presence helped Bob zero in. Actually, I was looking for the flag and I saw you. That's why I made my right hand turn. <laughs> Thank you. So I helped you out. Uh -oh. A little bit. Okay. I, was, I knew I was right on top of it. I would have had to wait for it to go on. But when I made the right, I saw the flag. I was told that at the World Championship, there are observers at each flag. But they go to great lengths to camouflage themselves. I couldn't have helped too much, though. Bob finished fourth in his category. And if you look closely through the trees, you'll see Jay Hennigan running past the flag. I guess he didn't see me, but he'll be back. I overshot two, and it was off the air, and mm -hmm. I was like just like right there, yep. and it came back on a mammoth. I think you were there filming. He was, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, two came back on, and I just swung around, and bang, there it was. Actually, lots of people overran this transmitter when it was off, then spun back when it came on. I think maybe the sharp bearings on 80 give you a greater sense of confidence to keep moving when the transmit is off. And finally, the finish line. Well, on your course, there are times you get very, very frustrated, but uh, caution that finish line feels pretty good. Yeah especially when you do it in a decent time. As predicted, the 80-meter hunt was easier and faster for almost everyone, assuming you found the finish line. The other side, other side, other side. Oh. Emily DeYoung liked it. Well, it was a very good course, long. There wasn't any difficulties. It was a really good course. Good exercise. Good running. Both courses were designed by Nadia Charlo. She's a two-time ARDF world champion, our event co-host today, and incidentally, wife of Charles Charlotte. Yesterday was a tough course because the map was yesterday was uh, more interesting than today. There was good map and good map for good competition. Today is kind of easy because their map is not very complicated, not very hard, so it's very hard to create very hard course here. Yesterday you have to think a lot, but today kind of you have to more run. Harley Leach. All that's left is the medal ceremony. M60. Many of the medal winners went on to compete in the 2006 World Championships in Bulgaria. I wonder, are we competitive at World? You've been in international competition. I've been to three. How worlds. well do you do? Well, I'm not great, and I admit it. Bottom third, maybe. But, you know, never been less. The U.S. needs lots more participation to become truly world class. Maybe you and your club would like to give it a try. I think we've shown that ARDF is not just for young athletes, but you will get in better shape. Interested? The place to start is Joe Mel's website. 
homingin.com. Let's see, there's something yeah. wrong here. I don't see a radio. It's back at the bathroom. It does it the hard way without the antenna. Yeah. And that's it for this edition of Amateur Radio Video News. I'd like to thank Charles and Nadia Charlo for accommodating me in shooting this event, and Joe Mel for archive video and lots of background information and assistance. I'm Gary Pierce, KN4AQ, and I'll see you next time. Stop walking! <laughs> <laughs> Come on, run! Stop walking! Wow, I can't go on. Cooper. Uh, That's what you call Cooper. Here's the video guy, he survived. <laughs> Those guys worked harder than I did, but man, I'm tired. <laughs>